As many of you are probably aware, this October marks 500 years since Martin Luther nailed uh, his 95 theses to the wall of, uh, yeah, okay, all right, uh, <laughs> at the church in Wittenberg. This is, for a lot of people, this symbolizes the beginning of the Protestant Reformation or the Second Great Schism, depending on where you fall on the uh, spectrum of belief. Um, maybe the First Great Schism, depending on where you fall on another issue, which was <laughs> much more complicated. Um, so, as exciting as it normally is for us in Rasher Christie just to present and tell you, here's what we think about such and such, uh, we just, I decided that we should maybe bring in some people with invested opinions on this uh, and dialogue back and forth. Uh, so today, we actually have two guests with us. We have Anthony and Trent, and Trent is the Protestant, despite his name, and, <laughs> and, and Anthony will, will be our Catholic. So how are you guys doing? Doing good. Glad to be here. That's good. Uh, so Trent, I'd like to start with you. Um, what exactly brought you here to A&M? Like, what are you, what are you doing here? Yeah, <laughs> great question. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, from uh, ever since I can remember existence, I was in the A&M Wednesday, all that stuff, third gen ag. So coming to A&M was not necessarily an option. It was something that I had to do. So I actually ended up uh, going to another school before I came here, A&M Commerce and Transferim. So yeah, always been a big, big Aggie and love this school. Um, once I got plug, plugged in here after transferring in my sophomore year, I joined a student organization called uh, CBL, Christian Business Leaders, and uh, it was a great organization just to talk about what it looks like uh, to be a Christian in the business world. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the, the way that I went, I guess not unfor unfortunately, uh, but uh, from a young age, I kind of knew that I was going to be ca called into pastoral ministry, and so I've been uh, pursuing that, and I currently uh, serve as a pastoral assistant here at a local, ch in a local church here in College Station. Uh, Really passionate, uh, just about um, God's word and and, and uh, just you know talking with people about Jesus. So, yeah. yeah. Now I said you're representing the Protestant perspective. Mm -hmm. As many of our um, friends will remind us that there are roughly 420,000 denominations of Protestantism. Mm -hmm. uh, so which uh, which flavor are you out of all of yeah. that? Uh, the spicy flavor for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so I uh, grew up in a non-denominational church. I currently am a member and work for a ba Baptist church. Uh, so my, my, my theological leanings would be uh, definitely Baptistic, uh, not necessarily in the organizational uh, sense of the SBC. I'm still learning about that, even though I'll be going to a seminary, uh, SBC seminary. I still don't quite know the ins and outs of the SBC. I'm learning all about that. Uh, I'm Reformed, uh, so Calvinist, uh, but don't <laughs> worry, I'm not a jerk. Um, so <laughs> just going just gonna to put that out, out there. Uh, other theological leanings, uh, compliment, uh, I'm a complementarian, I'm a cautious continuationist, if you know what that means, <laughs> anti-charismatic, um, and uh, yeah, and I yeah, think scripture is the word of God. As do we all, I hope. <laughs> so Anthony, you're joining us from across the Tiber, uh, so <laughs> what, what brings you here to College Station and what you're doing here at A&M? Um, I was good at math, and my parents told me I needed to make money. So I was like, <laughs> looks like I'm going to go do engineering. So where am I going to go do engineering? And it was the only school that ever crossed my radar. Uh, it was the only application I sent. I was brainwashed from an early age into the Aggie cult. And even if I had gotten into another school, I would have come to A&M because I just I, I love the culture here. I love the people. I feel comfortable here. It feels homey to me. Um, as far as what I do on campus, so I'm a civil engineering major uh, in my that's, I mean, that's what I do at class in my free time. My, my passion is definitely more philosophy, theology, literature. Um, as far as involvement goes, I've uh, had some pretty heavy involvement in the St. Mary's Catholic Center just off campus. And I've done quite a lot with Pro-Life Aggies, so the Pro-Life group on campus. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I see. And which denomination of Catholic are you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so at the lunch, he, uh, I believe your, your question was like, so what do you think about Pope Francis? Because that's usually <laughs> how you get it. Um, so I, I think that uh, I, don't really, I don't really like this whole like what type of Catholic you are because I feel like a lot of times it breaks down to, oh, who'd you vote for in the election? Like when you're talking to other Catholics and stuff. But if I had to like summarize it, I would say I like Pope Francis. I think he puts things more confusing than they need to be put sometimes. I'm from a weird Catholic homeschool family, one of the seven kid ones where it's like, oh yeah, they're at daily mass and it's like they're not old. So it's kind of weird to people sometimes. Uh, I love Thomas Aquinas, but I'm not a huge fan of people who 
are too theological at the expense of, you know, the religion aspect of it. My faith was reawakened by more charismatic elements of Catholicism, but I'm not a massive fan of charismatics in general. I love John Paul II. I completely agree with the social teaching of the church, and I try to go to daily mass whenever I can. So I'm an Orthodox Catholic. I like the Latin mass, but I don't think the Second Vatican Council was a den of heresy. <laughs> it sounds good. So the, uh, the topic is Catholic... Uh, versus Protestant. That's pretty broad. Um, so I want to narrow it down a little bit. The um, the main bones of contention for the Protestant reformers are widely summarized as what are called the five solas. Um, in English, it's faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, modern day Catholics more or less agree with all of those or so, give more or less. I would say that a lot of the issues that sparked the Reformation, namely the faith versus works debate, I would, once people sit down and talk about them, there's not nearly as much disagreement on those as one would think. Like, any, so I, I think you do see some elements of more cultural Catholicism where they, it drifts more to the superstitious aspects where it's like, oh, if you pray 40 rosaries, it's like, yes, you go to heaven. It's like, no, 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 that's not Orthodox Catholic theology. Orthodox Catholic theology does, uh, that you're not supposed to decouple faith and works, which I think mm -hmm. when you get down to it with a lot of Protestants, you'd find a very similar belief where it's, yes, we're not capable of meriting salvation, but we should still act as if we love God as mm -hmm. much as yeah. we can. Yeah, and we'll be getting into that particular one next week. Um, one of the more controversial ones, though, that I think most people still uh, consider a bone of contention would be this issue of Scripture alone, which more or less says the Protestants come along and say the Scriptures that we have are given by God. These are the sole authority uh, for us. They're the only ones that are divinely inspired. Um, whereas the Catholic Church uh, would say, actually, that authority is shared between three different entities. Scripture is one of them, but there's also tradition in the magisterium. Um, so I'd like to start first with Trent, if you would um, summarize for us and also and perhaps go into a little bit more detail than I just did on what, what exactly the principle of sola scriptura is. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's yeah, going, going over a lot of different things. And obviously in, in Protestant thought, there's a lot of different uh, kind of takes, and especially now with kind of where modern uh, church is. Uh, but generally speaking, sola scriptura just mean that um, the Bible, that the Bible is the sole authority, that that is uh, the Word of God, and that that's where um, churches, councils, where they derive their, their authority from, essentially. And that that's the ultimate, uh, if you will, check and balance to um, our religions. But uh, for most Pro Protestants, um, if you're familiar with some theological t terms, you know, believe in general revelation, special revelation. General re revelation being that, you know, uh, like the verses that the, the heavens and the mountains declare, declare your glory, so that from creation we can see, see and, and observe um, a, a creator God. Now, not you can't explicitly uh, be saved fr fr from that, but just you can get the idea of that. Then you have special revelation, which would be God's word. Um, and usually, I, I like talking about things from within the story of the Bible. So how we see that develop through is that uh, God created the, created the universe it was in the beginning. God, not in the beginning. Us it was in the be beginning. God, and He sets um, history f f forward. Uh, and so, breathing life into uh, people, giving life giving powers um, through the through the Holy Spirit, um, and you know, telling us how the, that we should live in the garden. Unfortunately, uh, man being uh, being drawn away and tempted by by Satan. Uh, ultimately turned and rebelled against God and did not believe that his word was true. So even from the beginning, there's this idea of, you know, did, did God really say what he what he said? Um, and then so from there you see um, just the development of the rest of the Old, the Old Testament through, uh, through prophets, you know, mainly Moses and other writings, um, ultimately uh, culminating in the end and close of the Old Testament. And then you and the whole Old Testament, ultimately, as we see, is pointing towards Christ. And, and as uh, John talks about, that he is uh, the sole embodiment of, of, of the Word. Uh, and, and that Christ himself even affirms uh, the Old Testament on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Um, and so he goes through, you know, that the, there's the, uh, the law, uh, the prophets, and the, the, the writing. So encompassing all of what was recognized Jewish scripture then, uh, affirming that. Uh, and then going for forward, he has his, his dis disciples who go out as apostles, uh, including pa Paul, um, to go out and proclaim the, proclaim the word. And so you see the early church in Acts 2. They're gathering around uh, God's word, and ultimately, I would say, you know, in the the uh, pastoral epistles, you know, First uh, and Second Timothy and, T and Titus, you see when Paul's instructing um, 
the those young pa pastors that uh, they should be te teaching and admonishing do doctrine. You're probably fam familiar with Second uh, Timothy three, three sixteen that uh, all that all scripture is God breathed, uh, which I would say is a call back to Genesis one um, and talking about that this is the God's life giving uh, power. It's it, it it is His word, and so obviously that's talking about the Old Testament. But from other passages like Second Peter, we see this affirmation of the fact that uh, the apostles' writings and those associated with them are also scripture as well, and that, um, again, th those pastors and th their authority to, to speak on um, doctrinal issues and teach the Word of God is not coming from their own words. It's coming from um, fr from sc Scripture it's, it itself, uh, even even the Scripture that was being passed around at the time, which is why I'm a big advocate for uh, what's called expositional preaching, so it's preaching through whole books of the Bible, uh, verse by, by verse, and not, um, not that topical preaching is bad, but, you know, who chooses the topic? Man does. And so when we go through it, and teach God's word. We should be going through it, um, and, and, and teaching the whole counsel sc scripture, um, so that we're 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 controlled and and uh, moved along by like what God says, and again, not what man says. So, I see. So, speaking. so it sounds like you're saying that God speaks to us through two different ways: this general revelation that kind of everyone can see, mm -hmm. and then there's special revelation. Um, but this special revelation is only found in the written works. Um, that uh, he, that God delivered to us. So that would be the uh, Hebrew Bible and the subsequently the New Testament. Would that be accurate? Yeah, de saying? definitely. Yes. That um, obviously there's d debate that I've alluded to on you know is yeah. most most Protestants are going to agree that the the canon clo closes. You know, then you get into the yeah. continuation. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get there. We'll definitely get there. Arguments, <laughs> but um, and. And that's more interesting even for people kind of where I kind of lean in the middle mm -hmm. of things. But um, generally speaking, this, the written scripture is, is, is closed. So. Now, you made a, an interesting point there about topical preaching. You say, who picks the topic? It's usually man. Now, I think it's interesting because you say that the Bible is your sufficient word um, or it's your sufficient authority. Uh, but apparently an individual could just grab something out of there. Mm -hmm. um, what would keep a normal believer from just grabbing his own Bible and grabbing something out of there? Mm -hmm. uh, say, I don't know, maybe he and his Bible under a tree, for example, or yeah. something to that effect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, there's, uh, so one of the recent Bible teachers that, I, that I've been listening to is a guy by the name of uh, Tim Mackey, who, uh, he, if you know, <laughs> thanks, Keith, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the Bible Project, they do videos for each book of the Bible, and they illustrate them, they're awesome, It's and they have a great reading plan, I encourage you to check that out. Uh, but one of the things he talks about with, the, with the, the Bible and the way that it's written as, you know, a book in scripture, it's not, you know, like recorded audio or something something like that is there is an inherent risk in, in, in doing it th th this way that people are going to come to the Bible and are going to come uh, to their own own op opinions um, but that's where the for for believers that's where the Holy Spirit um, guides us to be able to un understand and interpret the scriptures and yes there's going to be disagreements on, on that um, but that's part of it and that's part of being, uh, what I say, a lifelong long learner is that you come to the Bible, you think you understand one part, but then you realize that there's this other section of scripture, and so you synthesize those together, um, usually in, in systematic theology or biblical the theology, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got you. All right, well, thanks for that. I, I think that's a pretty good overview of, uh, of the Protestant perspective there. So, uh, Anthony now, so you would agree that scripture is authoritative, authoritative for, um, for Christians today. Uh, presumably, scripture comes from God. Uh, but like I mentioned, there are these other sources that are out there, uh, sacred tradition uh, and the magisterium. Um, so how exactly do those interact with each other? Uh, and how, how would you say that the authority is shared? Yeah, uh, so that's it's kind of an interesting one. When you read some more traditional Catholic theologians, so two of my favorite, well, not necessarily traditional, so Joseph Ratzinger, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, and then John Henry Newman, who was a famous Anglican convert to Catholicism back in the, the late 1800s, uh, they both have this to say about this, this whole interrelation between scripture and tradition, where they say that sacred scripture is materially sufficient, but not formally sufficient. So everything that's needed for salvation is found in scripture, but it's not so explicitly clear as to not require anything else. So I'm kind of going against this idea of like just me and my Bible under a tree, as you asserted. So one of the best analogies that I've heard for this is by another modern Catholic theologian named Mark Shea, who says, uh, he says, what's the difference between material and formal sufficiency? is the difference between having a big enough pile of bricks to build a house and having a house of bricks. Catholic teaching says sacred tradition, known as scripture, is materially sufficient. All the bricks necessary to build its doctrines are there in scripture. 
but because some things in Scripture are, are implicit rather than explicit, other stuff besides Scripture has been handed down from the apostles. This other stuff is unwritten sacred tradition, which is the mortar that holds the bricks of the written tradition together in the right order and position, and the magisterium, or the teaching authority of the church, which is the trowel in the hands of the master builder. So the thing giving these things directions. Taken together, these three things are formally sufficient for knowing the revealed truth of God. So it's not I, I, it's not as if, so kind of the, the heresy of Gnosticism, where it says that you have the scriptures, and then you have this other stuff that's like hidden knowledge, and it's like the Pope just kind of pulls out of his back pocket for kicks and giggles whenever he feels like it. Like, like, that's not what we're saying here. What we're saying is that the Bible itself, uh, when you, which is something I think you can kind of see by looking at the number of major theological differences among different denominations. So we're not just talking little things like, okay, is dancing or okay, or is it literally of the devil? Um, <laughs> We're talking about things like infant baptism or the actual uh, efficacious nature of baptism. Should abortion be okay or not? What is the whole deal with predestination? These are like really big theological differences between the denominations that all claim to utilize the same Bible as a source of authority. And that's enough proof that scripture alone is not explicitly clear enough so as to not be, so as to be formally sufficient. Um, and then these, the, to, to me, like what we're saying, what we're talking about these divisions, these are really big deals. It's a big deal that we have over 400,000 denominations because these divisions run contrary to the exhortation in Corinthians that says, uh, whatever you say, among, uh, he says, I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree what you say and that there be no divisions among you, that, but that you be united in the same mind in the same purpose. So sacred tradition, like I said, it's not just the Pope's back pocket of, okay, here we go, let's go, boom, dogma. It's um, it's the unwritten traditions of the apostles. It's the life of the church. It's the thing that puts those those bricks, the materially sufficient sacred scripture, in order. Uh, it's passed down from the apostles, so it's not like we just pull it up whenever. And I mean, and there is biblical scriptural basis for it as well. As the second letter to Thessalonians states, therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught, either by oral statement or by letter of ours. And the magisterium is this teaching authority that's able to, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, so it's not the authority of men, which is, I think, a very important thing to realize, too. Uh, we're not saying that there's one guy who's like, oh, just whenever he feels like it, just twist everything around. We're saying, no, that same Holy Spirit inspiration, which I believe we all as Christians believe is what gave us the Bible, that same Holy Spirit inspiration is what's working through the magisterium. So these things, they're not like separate entities that all have little bits and pieces that you have to like mesh together at the end. They are things that are not to be separated, not to be thrown apart. They all stand together as this unified body of the gospel of showing God's word. I see. Um, and, and you mentioned there a little bit about how the, um, the Pope doesn't just have a trap card that he pulls out whenever he wants to pull out dogma. Um, what are the conditions under which um, the, the Pope would establish dogma or, or any other authority within the magisterium? Yeah, so the, the conditions are that the Pope has to be speaking ex cathedra in his official capaci uh, capacity, and he has to be speaking in matters of faith and morals. And the Church is rather slow moving in this process, like centuries slow moving in a lot of cases, and you'll find that a lot of dogmas that are defined, it's not like, oh, okay, dogma of Immaculate Conception, just bam, here we go. It, no, these, these are things that have been in Catholic thought for centuries, for millennia, and these dogma, these dogmatic pronunciations are made whenever there's like major debates in the church and something needs to be clarified. Mm -hmm. I see. All right, um, before we transition to the discussion uh, back and forth, I think I'd like to point out that we are following the event on this hashtag here. If you want to tweet any pictures or questions or comments or in gifts, I don't know, um, uh, just tag it with hashtag RCTAMU, and uh, we'll, we'll be sure to get a hold of that. Okay, so uh, thanks, guys. That was a great overview there. Um, so I want to discuss this issue of the of the denominations. So Trent, so Anthony said that there are all these denominations that are out there within Protestantism, the Wesleyans, the uh, Reformed Baptists, the Presbyterians. If, I mean, you yourself are a Reformed Baptist, and yet there are Presbyterians that say, you know, you need to baptize your baby. So, so uh, do all of these denominations pose a threat to the idea that Scripture is the only infallible rule? Yeah, I mean, definitely at at first gl glance it does. I, I think it it also just proves the fact that when you're when you're when you're given um, 
you know, freedom of re religion, you're able to, uh, buy, you don't have to have bind your conscience to anything. So you see, you know, in passages like 1 Corinthians 8 or Romans 14 talking about like sacrifice meat, there is this idea of you don't want uh, any any believer to be doing something that's contrary to their conscience and what their their own conviction is. Um, so there is freedom in, in that. Um, but but what holds and, and, and binds all Protestants together and all, all Christians in, in, in general is the central, um, if you ever heard of the term theological triage those those first tier issues of who is Christ was the gospel who 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 is God and then there are the secondary issues that are important but you know like like things like infant baptism which I would just say you know it's, it's too little too early but it's it's um, th those are important issues but those are things that um, I you know I have Presbyterian fr friends and uh, that that and I've learned a lot from Presbyterians a lot obviously be, be, being reformed but just we ha have disagreements about um, so yes, there are, are these other you know councils and, and, and uh, different uh, statements of, of faith, but it's just the, the fact that we're able to come to, to, to um, our own con conclusions, but still have those central um, th things in common that are that are explicit in scripture. Something like baptism, that's a little bit more, more, more debatable, and, and uh, the clear things are clear, the unclear things, that's where the disagreements you, you have are proper dividing. Mm -hmm. Now there is very dumb divisions within in the church, like um, you, you know, just like what carpet's going to go into the new build, building or stuff like that. Yeah. Like that's not a, a scriptural matter. That's not a, right. an issue that should, should divide us. I mean, maybe if it was like a really outrageous color, I don't know, but um, <laughs> a neon green. But yeah. um, I'm yeah. sure some church is going to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, so, so, yeah. uh, so Anthony mentioned um, that in those matters that are kind of unclear. Um, that's typically where the the authority of the Catholic Church will come in. Sacred tradition, for example, will clear all that up. Protestants kind of have their own version of that. Uh, for example, the Westminster mm -hmm. Confession, uh, the London Baptist Confession, yeah. which they serve kind of the same purpose, but presumably you wouldn't consider those to be authoritative. Right. Th th they're de definitely, this goes back to kind of what I was saying earlier, those are helpful. Like if, you, if you've never gone through and, and Read, I would encourage you to read your own church's statement of faith, whatever church that you're a member of. Hopefully you're a member of a local church here. Um, to go in and know what your church is say, saying on, on things, uh, as well as those, uh, those other confessions. They're great for, for, for systematizing, understanding what the Bible says about a, a specific topic. But those in and of themselves are not authoritative. You have to constantly, you know, just like an Acts, have the heart of a Berean going back and seeing uh, what does Scripture s say about, about this. Um, so, yes, they're helpful. I'm not, like, saying that, you know, that, pastors are, are, you know, are bad or that they're that uh, you shouldn't be listening to Bible teachers like the obviously God has gifted the, the, the church to have uh, uh, men, men come up and explain God's word uh, which is great I, I love s sitting under my own pastors as well as listening to other uh, pastors of different de denominations um, and, and being able to learn from them but at the end of the day uh, that is not authoritative and the only authority that they have is what they're speaking on from from explaining mm -hmm. scripture itself yeah. so so Anthony it sounds like Trent is saying that yes there are these divisions but the overwhelming majority of them are they're not as critical as they might appear to be at first glance um, do you think that that is a successful way to just move the bar up and say all these divisions are actually not that important? Well, not necessarily, because I think a lot of these divisions that we're talking about are kind of a big deal. Like when you're mm -hmm. talking about is baptism efficacious or is it not efficacious, we're talking about how are we going to get to heaven. And that is a pretty big theological difference that within Protestant denominations even. And I mean, if we're going like Catholic versus Protestant denominations, I, I think that even this idea of like, is the Eucharist the real presence and things like that, like that is a really big deal too. This isn't just little things that I think can or should be brushed off as, okay, well, that's just like little things and we're all still kind of Christians at the end of the day. And it, to me, the, this idea of um, going in on your own too, if we believe that there is an objective truth, then I think that it reasonably, logically, making it, it makes sense that there, that objective truth is something that should be strived for, like in commonality as a church, if we're going to talk about the church as one unit. And all these different divisions that are have a lot of differences, that means that somebody here is wrong. Somebody here is not in accordance with that objective truth. And I think that uh, like this idea of that you have just scripture and that scripture is also formally sufficient to me is analogous to if the U.S. Constitution had just been dropped down is like okay now good luck here you go but without any like U.S. government to say this is how the Constitution is going to be implemented it's something that um, I, I just don't think follows through it doesn't really make a lot of sense mm -hmm. I see so I think 
that's kind of interesting how you said there are a lot of these different beliefs that perhaps people have, um, and they may or may not have been, um, they may be from scripture, but they may not actually be, you know, in scripture. So I think there might be, I might be forcing a parallel here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, there may be a parallel here with certain beliefs that perhaps the early church didn't believe, or may or may not have believed, but were later codified in um, Catholic dogma. So I'm thinking, for example, the Assumption of Mary is one that was fairly recently uh, dogmatized, if that's the correct verb. Um, sure. Yeah, <laughs> sure, we'll go with that. Uh, well, I'll say codified then. Uh, it was fairly recently codified as, as a matter of dogma, but presumably people, not all Christians have believed that for uh, the you know, 20 or so centuries that uh, Christianity has been around. So it seems like you could almost run a similar case and say that perhaps the authority of the Catholic Church is effective now, but there are still divisions as far as you go back, or if, if that makes sense. I mean, that's kind of, the, like I said, that's the, the point of declaring something dogmatically mm -hmm. is to say through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, yes, this is how it is. But I mean, with like with the specific case of the Assumption, yeah. that was a belief that was fairly commonly held for most of the church's history as well. Uh, like you can look at documents going all the way back to like three, 400 AD to see like that this was, I mean, like, even like in Renaissance and medieval mm -hmm. paintings, like there are paintings of like the Assumption of Mary. It was a belief that was held by many Catholics and then fairly recently, yes, it was codified, I guess, dogmatized, yeah. dogmatized sounds cooler, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so, so it's not, like I said, it's not like the Pope just kind of plays his bam dogma card. It's something that mm -hmm. has been an issue, has been discussed for a very long time and then through prayer, through the, that same inspiration of the Holy Spirit that I think we all as Christians believe is what gave us sacred scriptures. That's how we arrive at that conclusion. Okay. Um, so Trent, um, I think that's a, that's a good stopping point for that conversation. Uh, speaking a little bit more about diversity though, um, your Bible has 66 books, mm -hmm. and that is your sole infallible rule of faith. Right. Anthony's Bible has an expansion pack on there. <laughs> <laughs> Known as the Deuterocanonical books. Apocrypha, yeah. Well, I'll be nice. Potato, potato. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it seems that there may be another issue here. Um, you're saying that Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith, mm -hmm. but it seems like you don't even have the same definition of Scripture between, uh, between the two perspectives. So, um, so how do you go about just saying these 66 and not... Uh, right. The additional ones. I mean, so with like speaking to the apocrypha, like talking about those 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 books with within the uh, like we would say the 400 year, years of of silence uh, that there was no prophet around, and even I I'm, I'm blanking on the actual uh, specific text, but even like within that, you see that there's a recognition recognition that there isn't a prophet that someone is speaking on, on behalf of God. And again, I, I appeal to Luke 24 uh, that Jesus is talking about the, those those scriptures. Jesus himself never ne never from the, those um, sorry those writings. Um, I realize I said scriptures earlier. Um, never from those when he talk, talks about the the the, the law um the the right the writings as well as the uh, and i'm blanking on one of them right now that's him him affirming uh the what what was um jewish literature at the time that was that was carried out um, by prophets so um that's why we would say it not that those writings are interesting and helpful in a s historic sense of understanding um, the development of jewish thought um, but we would not say that those are divinely in inspired uh, because again jesus himself didn't even uh, affirm those mm -hmm. i see and and anthony presumably for you, um, the in, in Catholicism, the uh, authority of the canon was established by uh, one of the other two branches of authority. I believe the magisterium. Is that correct? It was established. The, the canon, as we know it now, was established kind of by the councils of Hippo and Carthage, kind of in mm -hmm. the late 400s, and then. In that same vein of like, okay, dogma, this is, so we're having arguments now. It was like in Trent, they're like, okay, yes, this is definitely the canon. I mean, but they had that canon in place since Hippo and Carthage back in the 400s. I see. And so would this be a case kind of like with the Assumption of Mary that for several centuries, Christians had sort of recognized what the books were, and then they just sort of put the stamp of approval on it? N not necessarily. So I mean, these count, like the books didn't change at all from Hippo right. or Carthage. And if like, yeah. just for a little... I don't know if you want like a fall asleep kind of history thing and like the Deuterocanonical versus Apocrypha. It's not, I personally don't think it's that big of an issue to where I would go to a holy war with somebody over it. <laughs> because with the exception of some praying to the dead verses in Maccabees, which could be construed as an argument for purgatory, there's not a lot of like massive theological headbutting 
in any of these wisdom books or any of these deuterocanonical books that are here. Uh, now, as to like art, should they be included? I mean, that edition of the Bible that was floating around at that time, the Septuagint that Jesus quoted most of the time, included those books. And it was only after the temple was burned in Jerusalem, after the Romans burned it, that the Jews actually came together and they established their own they took those books out with ma- the main rationale was that they couldn't find original Hebrew translations, uh, even though for so for the, the, the but the Christian tradition kept those books in for all of this time, and then when you get to the Reformation, Luther just does a little hammer thing, and then he's like, well, there's these books in the Bible, and he sees that there's arguments against them, and he also wanted to take out the Book of James as well, but he didn't do that. Um, so and that's kind of like a little bit of the historical background of it. And honestly, I to me, I don't see why it's a massive deal, but like looking at the historical nature. Of that I, that's kind of why we still have them in. To me, the, the bigger issue here is that for 400 years, you didn't have a codified, like, scriptural canon. And it's like, so if you're saying that scripture is that sole authoritative source, but you don't even have that sole authoritative source yet, what were people to do back then? And you have all these other weird things floating around, like the Gnostic things. It's like, okay, well, the stuff that gave us the Da Vinci Code and stuff like that. It's like you have all these Gnostic gospels, so what exactly was a Christian supposed to do then? Yeah, and... Th- that's a very common objection to, to sola scriptura. Um, I do want to ask you this, though. If you were to look backwards, presumably you also don't have the, uh, you don't have tradition or the magisterium at that time either, presumably. And if you go backwards, uh, back into um, particularly the, the time of the Jews prior to Christ, uh, it, I, to my knowledge, I don't think that there are any parallels to um, Catholic authority at, uh, within the Jewish context. Would that be accurate? Uh, no, because as we say, the sacred tradition is passed on by the apostles. So we, that's the that's life true. of the church as passed down. And the magisterium derives its teaching authority from the apostles. It's like, so the marks of the church that like, got hammered in my head as a second grade, a little Catholic homeschool kid. The church yeah. is one holy Catholic apostolic. I got you. So apostolic secession is one united church. It is Catholic, so universal, and it's holy, so like in accord with like the will of God and stuff. I got you. So Trent, there's a lot of information there, a lot of boring history facts too. Uh, so is there anything you'd like to come back on? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I must admit I'm not, I'm not as familiar with the, the history side of things. That's obviously something that I'll, I'll learn much more uh, in seminary, but just more of um, the, the, as far as the development of things, again, like uh, from what my understanding of the park for literature, there's also not um, a messianic line through, 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 through these writings, from what I understand. I could be wrong. Fact check me on, on that. So, again, Christ, when Christ comes on the scene, he's saying that he's the fulfillment of all, of all these things. I mean, that's good and proper biblical theology. And, uh, again, going back to Luke 24, of just, like, him affirming that these that these writings are all about me, not just about me, and here, let me explain them. I mean, that was probably the greatest seminary lesson right there. I wish I could have been there to understand that through those men, they went out and gave us uh, the, the, what is the, the New Testament. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I mean, you have, you know, even even to, you know, your use of uh, the second the Thessalonian verse of, you know, the oral tra- tradition stuff, I, I would say that that's more, more talking about also just the Jewish literature, how that was passed down. And again, like, not everything was written down at the, t- the the time, but the apostles' teachings were being were being um, sent around, focused on uh, again in, in, in Acts two that they were devoting themselves to the apostles' te- teaching um, because they were the ones that had interacted with and were specifically uh, sent out by Christ. And then again with the close of, of canon, even with the debates within Protestantism. We would say that the scripture clo- closed. There is other little squibbles here on <laughs> extra revelation, but um, but generally speaking, the the can was closed with the last apostle dying off and writing the the, the revelation. Yeah, what exactly is all this extra revelation stuff you're like talking about? <laughs> uh, basically, uh, great question. Um, so I, I recently just uh, finished a book uh, called "Are You There, Lord?" which is written from a cessationist perspective. So uh, basically, saying that. Um, what's commonly known as the sign gifts, so, you know, healing, uh, prophecy, uh, tongues, that those closed with with the, um, the, 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 when the canon, when Revelation was was written, that, that was it, that was the end of the apostolic er, er, era, and so no extra revelation w- was happening. Um, we're we're kind of where I stand on things is, uh, I use the term very strongly, cautious continuationist, where I don't, I, I can't come to a full scriptural basis of saying that these gifts have ended. Um, however, I think where kind of the, the charismatic uh, movement has gone is not helpful. And just especially when, you know, we're talking about these different urges and, 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 and longings and stirrings within and, and, you know, seeking out the voice of God. It's like, man, you have this 
book right here, like open it up. Like, and also you don't need to know about what job you need to take. Like the Lord's concerned about you growing in your holiness, not, you know, am I going to be an accountant or am I, you know, going to work as a plumber? Both are good and in, in jobs that, br- that bring honor and glory to the Lord and can further his kingdom. Uh, you don't need extra urges within, within yeah. inside. Uh, but again, as from a scriptural base, basis, I'm not entirely confident, especially with something like healing, that that's closed. Um, and so yeah, that's something I wrestle with. Right. And, and and you say that most Christians, they can just look at this book. Um, but like Anthony mentioned, you have about three or four hundred years uh, after uh, Jesus's ascension where there is no book. Uh, most people recognize that Justin Martyr, one of the great uh, early apologists, one of my personal heroes, uh, <laughs> Only, he did all of his work just with the first four Gospels, um, and none of the epistles or anything like that. Um, and because of that, he had some weird views about some things because he didn't quite understand what Paul's commentary was. Uh, so it seems kind of peculiar to say that this standard, uh, the, the Scripture alone, um, is your authority, whenever that authority for 300 years may not have even been um, accessible by the majority of Christians. And... Uh, on top of that, we don't even know what the boundaries are until about 400 years or so. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I feel like I'll be repeating some of the stuff that I've already, already said, but yeah. just the the recognition, especially like in a passage like Second um, like Second Peter, where Peter's affirming like that, that Paul's writing writings are scripture, and again that Christ is specifically saying those doubt that the early church is uh, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, and that these letters are being sent around. Um, they're they're written to specific local churches, but then also sent around. Um, to uh, uh, other churches by by various people, um, so that and that they were growing in understanding, um, you know how they were supposed to live. All things pertaining to life and godliness. That that, that is uh, uh, against when Paul speaking to to Timothy that uh, that all scriptures God be and it's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in right righteousness. That, that these things have value. Uh, as far as like the formation uh, of scripture, uh, from my understanding, that you know just at those time those were already recognized, uh, but. Again, I'm, mm. I'm less familiar with the history of I it all. You. All right. So I think um, Trent just put the smack down on you there. First Timothy says, all scripture is profitable for all good works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just says, like, I agree that scripture is profitable. Like, I mean, like mm. I said, it's the materially versus formally sufficient. I okay. Mean, it, when it says all scripture, it's not saying, oh, and all tradition is not there. I mean, you have okay. all the other verses saying, like, hold fast to the traditions that have been passed on to you. Like, yeah. And I, I will say, like, and just as like a, this is kind of a little side tangent, like I do really appreciate the scriptural emphasis that Protestants bring to the table. I think mm-hmm. that theologically, Catholics, like we, we say that scripture is like that super important thing, but practically speaking, a lot of us, myself included, kind of suck at actually studying it. Mm-hmm. So in that way, I'm very grateful and blessed by the witness of like Protestants that I see and their yeah. devotion to scriptures. Like I, I need that in my life, in my spiritual life as well. Like that is the word of God, which is a really mm-hmm. big deal and yeah. the biggest deal. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I think, I think we should focus a little more on that question about what all scripture is. Um, Paul presumably wrote that around 50 or 60 AD. Uh, most people recognize that the gospels were written uh, 60 through 80 AD. John was written in 90. It seems kind of odd to say, uh, to take this verse and say all scripture is profitable mm-hmm. and then apply it to these books that Paul didn't even know were being written at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, again, just the recognition that the Bible has a, of the fact that um, that the New Testament books are are, are, are scripture, um, and that that they are being sent out, you know, by Christ to be able to um, go, go teach and being sent on on His beha- behalf. And so they're the ones um, that this is what I love about about the New Testament is they're they're unpacking all the things from the, the Old Testament as well as uh, Jesus' teachings within in the Gospel. And there's always direct um, connections back back and forth and. Explain Explaining how these things, what these things mean, for um, you know, on the Christian living side of things, uh, you know. Personally, I think that a lot of times we focus too much on the New Testament. I think we, you know, there's this other huge section of your of your Bibles that are out there that uh, when you understand that, especially in a book like Romans, really help, help you to uh, understand uh, more and more what the weightiness of uh, of things like substitutionary atonement of uh, you know uh, Christ. Um, being the ultimate sacrifice and seeing how he was the fulfillment of things for the Old Testament, um, but but yes, like uh, again, just the the way that Scripture just kind of reaffirms itself is is what I point to in the confidence um, that I have that it is authoritative, uh, and that they again the apostles were sent out by Christ Himself. Yeah, uh, if I may interject briefly, real quick, uh, this is kind of just like a, a 
personal thing that I've that I noticed. This this idea of scripture alone and you being able to interpret scripture yourself, it works in theory in a society where you have widespread literacy, where you have people with the education systems, the mechanisms to be able to do that. That's not a privilege that a lot of people have had over history. Like through a great deal of the Middle Ages, through a great deal of Roman times, not a lot of people knew how to read, and those people that did know how to read couldn't necessarily read the translations of scripture that were available. So I do also like the fact that the Protestant Reformation did induce more of the vernacular translations of scripture. Uh, but once again, this, this idea of like that individual finding of divine revelation through scripture, this idea that scripture is formally sufficient, doesn't really apply in a place where not everyone's able to do that. So it's like, what are you supposed to do about that other large segment of human history that did not have access to these books? in that way yeah yeah that's great um well i would say just like going back to kind of like the what scripture scripture is like largely it's it, it is meditation literature so it's this this idea you know especially like i read psalm 119 this morning of uh david meditating on the commands precepts he used all these different ways of, of describing scripture and its sweetness and that um again those were those were passed down in and you know within jewish culture um, and that people understand and memorize whole books of the bible you know what a novel idea uh, i can only memorize a few verses is here and here, um, and uh, just just seeing that it is something that is personal, but there obviously is a, a corporate a a aspect of things. And again, that the Lord has gifted uh, us uh, men who are called to go and teach teach God's word. But that's what they're doing; they're teaching God's word. And that's um, you know, you talk about the literacy literacy issue. I mean, that's why we you know we have a in. Ridiculous amount of English translations. I mean, it's which is great. I'm thankful for the different English translations and the different debates on that. But it's like, we, why are we putting our, our energy and focus into getting it, the Bible into languages uh, for unreached people groups and getting out there? So and training men, men and women to go out and to uh, teach the the Word of God to people. So just simply saying that, like, um, that. Well, what about literacy issues? I mean, that's that's the motivating force of getting people. Um, access to God's word and, and, to, and sound doctrine is by um, is the, the motivation behind missions and, hear, and seeing every t tongue, tribe, and nation come to know the good news of Jesus. Anything oh, that's All right. <laughs> uh, so we're going to transition to um, a little bit of audience participation here. Um, please do not line up uh, in the center. <laughs> That would just be a mess. Um, this is a good mic, so you or can just yell at pitchforks outside if you would like to <laughs> grab some. <laughs> no. I got you. Um, so for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, if you have a, a question that you would like to ask one of the guys up here, uh, just raise your hand. We'll go. I'll point at you. Typical thing. So, uh, does anyone have a question? That they would? Yes. What was the name of the author that y'all were talking about that only had access to the Gospels but not Paul's epistles? That would be Saint Justin Martyr. Yeah, Saint Justin Martyr. I think he's saying. I don't remember. Yeah. yeah. M a r t y r. Yeah. It's not a last name. But it's not a last name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Last names are also a modern innovation. Yes. He was a first name saint. Justin's is. All right. Anyone else? Barkley. Uh, this is for for uh, Trent. Yes. I had a, I'm just gonna read something to you really quick. I was wondering what your take on it was. Um, this is a quote from somewhere. Let us therefore lie in wait for the just, because he is not for our turn, and he is contrary to our doings, and has raised us with transgressions of the law, and divulges against us the sins of our way of life. He boasts that he has knowledge of God, and calls himself the Son of God. He has become a censor of our thoughts, he is grievous unto us even to behold. For his life is not like other men's, and his ways are different. We are esteemed by him as triflers, and he abstains from our ways as from filthiness, he prefers the latter end of the just and glories that God is his father. Let us see then if his words be true. Let us prove what shall happen to him, and we shall know what his end shall be. For if he is truly the son of God, God will defend him and will deliver him from the hand, hands of his enemies. Let us examine him by outrages and torture, that we may know his meekness and try his patience. Let us condemn him to a most shameful death, for there shall be respect had unto him by his words. So my question, I guess, is what does that sound like to you? Yeah, what's uh, quoting, quoting a passage of scripture? Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that was really long. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> lots, talk. lots to keep up, keep up with it there. Um, in turn, so like the the context of what whatever that passage is talking about, if t testing these things and making sure that they're correct, help me understand 
And yes, sir. I, well, particularly where it says, glory is the God of his father, uh, says that he, is a, that he is the son of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like who's that potentially talking about? Yeah, so what does that sound like to you? Like if you were to just pick that up and read it. Yeah, I would say that that's t- t- talking about Christ potentially. Okay, that, so that's from the quote-unquote apocrypha. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's I started the apocrypha. Like the, a lot of the stuff in it is like I don't really see why it's a theological issue. Like you have like the Book of Tobit and Judith and stuff. It's just like some really good stories that even if you don't think it's scriptural, like you probably think that it's at least a good story. So mm-hmm. I mean, I, that's one that's yeah. I, like I said, with the exception of the Maccabees passage, I'm praying for the dead. It's like I don't see why we're fighting as much over that one. Mm-hmm. I think people get spooked out by Bell and the Dragon. And that's just kind of a weird. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Again, like just reiterating the, the point that I had er, earlier is just that Jesus and how he one that he didn't quote, quote from there. There was no prophet dur- during that time, and so um, what we would understand as, as inspired scripture uh, is just not the standard that we see throughout the the, the rest of the Bible. Um, so yeah. Again, I like I said earlier, I'm not as familiar with the apocrypha I met. Another question? I'll show you first. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, what um, what is there to stop me from like, misinterpreting um, scripture, or is there is it more like an understanding that I'm not misunderstanding misunderstanding scripture? If it's something that's coming from like, Christ in the heart. Right, right, yeah. I mean, that's again that goes back to what I was talking about the inherent the inherent risk of how, of how that's out there of just hand hand this book book, book to people. Um, so it's both of the, the, the understanding that God's given give, give us mind, minds to be able to re, to reason and un, understand these things, uh, especially the things that are more cl- clear. Uh, and then the, you know, again, going through theological triage, those things that are that are less clear in Scripture. You know, um, you know, some, you know. So you have something like you know, um, you know, is, is is Christ God or something like again, like can we dance or something like that? Like obviously, that's a less clear and explicit in, in Scripture. Um, so it's, it's it's coming to the the Bible and and use it, using our minds to un, understand, uh, not just look at Scripture in isolation, but looking at it in the whole. And yes, using outside um, sources and and even looking at like um, dare dare I say tra- tradition and orthodoxy. Uh, but again, those aren't. Um, those aren't in and of themselves God's word and are authoritative. And so, yeah, there's a trust and faith, faith in that the Holy Spirit is going to get God and help us to understand the scriptures, which is the, the primary role of, uh, of the Spirit, uh, apart from, you know, regeneration and salvation. I'll second. Um, Trent, I had a question about your opinion on baptism. You said too young, too early. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how do you reconcile that belief with the scripture? I believe it's Mark chapter 16, it's at the end of one of the Gospels, um, where Jesus said, those who, something, I'm paraphrasing, those who profess faith, faith in me and are baptized will be with me in heaven, something along those lines. So the key point is that like, he includes baptism in that, like as in baptism is necessary for salvation. So if that's the case, then why shouldn't it intent be baptized? Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly in Mark 16 because there's also debate on towards the end if that's even a part of um, scripture. But yeah, um, yeah. As far as uh, again, like just a general interpretive uh, per- per- perspective, um, you got when it. Whenever you're looking at um, scripture passages like that, like that, you got to do it in comparison with the rest of rest of scripture. So not just doing uh, what's called eisegesis. Looking at that text in and of itself, but seeing uh, what else the Scripture says, and you see all th- throughout, especially in the New Testament, that we're saved, saved by faith and not not, not by works. So, what in my, my perspective, uh, you know, as a Baptist, is that um, that infant baptism, not infant baptism, uh, baptism, by, you know, by immersion, is, is an act of obedience. Uh, that and it's actually. Um, I would use language that the Presbyterians would say that it is there is a covenantal aspect of it that you're that you're saying that I'm covenanting with the body of body of Christ that this is an outward profession, um, but I would disagree with Presbyterians in their um, in the way they come about it of like this this is a covenant sign uh, for children. I just wouldn't say that that carries over uh, from the Old Old Testament, um, and obviously it's not explicit. Uh, in the Bible. Does that answer your question? Well, how would you reconcile that with the, the part of Acts where it says that they baptized yeah. entire families? All his household. Yeah, yeah. his whole household. Salvation was brought, brought to his whole household. Yeah, that is the main verse that, 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 that uh, Presbyterians will, will, will use for that. Um, 
the 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 covenant sign of circumcision that they try to bring over i would i would say um in a the a progressive re revelation sense uh, is talking about circumcision of the heart on this side of christ mm -hmm. so not actually dealing with um, a covenant sign of of because now uh it's not that that uh, god's people are just a a a particular ethnic group it's people of all all nations so it's not limited to uh one one group of people um now i i do re respect and i love that presbyterians and even things like practices like catechism that you know i know catholics do is, is as well by yes train your child up in the lord but i'm not going to tell them that they're, they're they're a believer or that they're you know a this is bad, bad terminology but pseudo christian and, and to be fair even other denominations have their own way of of doing that in practice um, but again it's it's not explicit and to answer about that specific text uh, i would i would say that that's more talking about the, the fact that through um this one person coming to faith in, in christ that that's sp spreading out to other other people because um I, I believe it w was a man that came to faith, and so that's spreading around to the the rest of the house and the opportunity uh, because this household has heard the the gospel that now they get to, to hear it as well. I see. I saw Sam first. I had a question for Trent. Uh, <laughs> hey, well, well, when you have a council named after you, you know people just want to ask <laughs> questions. <laughs> so I'm actually so kind of playing devil's advocate. Oh, fine. I love this. <laughs> a pope's advocate. <laughs> oh. What's the difference? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's again, it's again, where where is that authority come from? So f like on that issue specifically, like dealing with um, Arianism, the Trinity, that's in response to something out there. So those people went back to Scripture and said, okay, here's what Scripture is saying about that, and then here's what we're saying from Scripture that it's saying about those specific topics. So I have no issue with councils. You know, uh, the recent Nashville statement um, that, that that came out, stuff like that, where Christian groups have gotten t together to uh, affirm what the Bible says in response to. Uh, heresies being sp spoken out so those are great and you even see um you know in the early church in acts like them gathering and trying to discern uh, you know what we need to do so that that practice and that tradition again it's, it's fine it's wonderful that christians of different denominations you know talking about the national statement that multiple people coming together for um that to talk about sexual ethics um that's a great and wonderful thing but again those in themselves are not authoritative it's 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 where they're coming from which is scripture god's revealed word are there any questions for anthony <laughs> oh goodness so many um we'll go with colin okay <laughs> Okay. Okay, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. um, seeing as Catholic, um, the Catholic Church itself derives its authority from the scriptures, would it not then be sort of circular to say that the scriptures only get to be defined by the Catholic Church? No, because, I mean, we're not saying that we derive our authority from the scriptures. We're saying we derive our authority from Jesus Christ. And, like, as we were saying, that it, these, we didn't even have this codified, like, canon of scripture for the first three or four hundred years. Like, our, our canon of scripture comes from councils that were Catholic, like, very Catholic in nature. So it's not that the church develops, derives its authority from scripture. The church derives its authority from Christ. And the scripture also derives its authority from Christ. But it was the church that helped codify through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, like, what is scripture in the first place? All right, next question, anyone? Um, yes, sir. Hi, Anthony. Um, Hi. Howdy. Okay. I wanted to ask you about something. It's, it's a general thing that's bugged me, so I'll try to narrow it down to maybe an example. I have a couple of examples, but I'll try to narrow it down to one. Um, so uh, talking about the doctrine of the Mass, I want to first ask you a little bit about passage of Scripture and then ask you about the Mass uh, from... Hopefully I'm understanding it correctly. So first, the passage of scripture and how it works with Mass. So, um, so in uh, Hebrews chapter nine, uh, 
the writer says that for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, uh, but into heaven itself, uh, and now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed again, uh, needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. Now at once the consummation of ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, after this comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin for those who eagerly, eagerly await for eager, eagerly await for him. So, um, basically, that talking about uh, Jesus having died once and all for our sins, uh, when he says on the cross, it is finished, um, he says that his, his work is finished. And so, um, then I have this explanation of the Mass um, from John O'Brien in his book, The Faith of Millions. I have no idea who that guy is. Okay, but okay yeah, go for he's it. He's a Catholic priest. Okay. Um, and so he explains the Mass. Um, and so he says, when the priest pronounces the tremendous words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens, brings Christ down from his throne, and places him upon our altar to be offered up again as a victim for the sins of man. It is a power greater than that of monarchs and emperors. It is greater than that of saints and angels, greater that, than that of seraphim and cherubim. Indeed, it is greater even than the power of the Virgin Mary, which we can't talk about otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have another hour. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. While the Blessed Virgin was the human agency by which Christ became incarnate a single time, the priest brings Christ down from heaven and renders him present on our altar as the eternal victim for the sins of man, not once but a thousand times. The priest speaks in low, Christ the eternal and omnipotent, omnipotent God, bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. Is that an accurate uh, representation of the Mass, saying that um, the priest every day brings Christ down to suffer for our sins, um, and that going along with transubstantiation and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, so, uh, okay, so I'm going to give you like a, a few part answer to it as best I understand. Sure. First off, just caveat for everybody. Sorry if this really sounds like a cop out, but I think it's also very important to realize that I am not a teaching authority of the church, okay? <laughs> Neither is that guy that wrote that book right there, John, Father O'Brien right there. I'm sure that that book in elements could be could be good, but we're not saying this is like authoritative in the same way like scripture, sacred tradition, majesty, the, te the official teaching of the church is. So with that caveat out of the way, so I don't get like smitten by lightning bolt after this answer. Anyway, um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, with that, with that out of the way, so I, there's a few things that uh, w that I think are we need to to bring to realization here. Is the, the the first is that the mass itself is very is it's scriptural. Like I mean, the Last Supper when Jesus says, "Do this in memory of me," that's what we're doing in the mass. Those are the exact words of consecration that are professed in every single mass throughout the history of the church. I mean, and you have like the Gospel of John in John six where he says, "Eat my body, drink my blood. If you don't, you will not have life within you." And he uses like the most literal senses of the words. It weirds out the Pharisees so much they're just like bye sorry not into that and then there, and then he asked the rest of his followers are you going to leave too and they're like who else are we going to go to you have the words of the eternal life the point is that he's not like yep oh jk guys it's a metaphor it's no 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 you really eat my body you drink my blood that's the way this deal works um and so when we're saying like at the sacrifice of the mass it's the same sacrifice of the mass it's the same sacrifice at calvary it's not repeated throughout every mass. It's the same sacrifice when participating in that sacrifice. All right? And that would be more like the official like Catholic theology behind it. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Is there like an addendum to it that doesn't make sense to you? No. Okay, what about it? <laughs> I mean, it, it seems like, and, and I don't have other examples, but from other things that I've read about it, is that it sounds like we're participating in it over and over and over. Um, <coughs> Versus it being a once and all, once for all accomplished thing. And this, and dang it, man, this leads to another question. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone else in Unfortunately, line, we are running very low on time. Okay. okay. So. Yeah, we can talk about it afterwards yeah, too. Yeah, sounds yeah. good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right. Uh, so, um, if you could, both of you, just sixty-second closing statement. Uh, we'll start with Trent. Uh, mm -hmm. Just final words for you. Yeah, I mean, th this this issue ma matters because it's a matter of who God is, and that's the most important. Um, 
question for 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 any human being is under, under is who do you say that the the God is? Um, so you know what, whether that's you know revealed by Scripture alone or Scripture, and then all, also um, sacred tradition. These these things matter. And so uh, again, my posi- position is that God has revealed Himself self through His Word, and and more specifically in the, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, uh, which the whole Scripture uh, in its entirety is is pointing to Christ, and that Christ Himself even you know quotes the Scripture. He he himself talks about, he even talks to Pharisees about their own tr- traditions and, and talks about things in line with Scripture and that uh, this stuff matters. Again, going back to the, the Genesis account of, of, of Satan twisting the, wor- the, the words of God, um, that, that we always need to be going ba- ba- back to and recognizing uh, who God is, who he says he is, not, who, not what we say that he is, but who he says he is, uh, and having a God-centered theology and not a man-centered theology, uh, because this, this book is not about us. It's in the beginning God. It's not in the beginning you. And so understanding that what's most important is understanding who God is. Um, and, and yes, we can also understand ourselves, but it's first understanding who God is and understanding uh, the, the personal work of Jesus Christ. All right. And Anthony, just parting word from you too. Yeah, I mean, understanding who God is, it's kind of like the point of this whole Christianity deal is that we believe there is a God of the universe who loves us. And so what are we to do in the face of that love? Um, but I, I think the the reasons that I'm personally Catholic that I that I've seen is that it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me to have this idea of the subjective truth. But then everybody go do your own thing and go ahead and just see what happens and let's hope that it works. I, when you look at the history of the church, though, you look at the church fathers, you look at the apostolic succession, you look at the fact that you can trace the popes in an unbroken line all the way back to Peter. All these things, I think that it's reasonable to conclude that there is something to the Catholic Church's claims here that the scripture is inspired by Christ, but then you also have like that unwritten tradition of the apostles. And if we're going to go ahead and discount that, then you have to discount, you know, those years when the scripture wasn't formally dogmatized, I guess is the word we decided on. (laughs) When when that wasn't dogmatized, and you have to discount all of these like developments of like the fact that there was illiteracy for much of the world through much of human history. So I mean, with that, be Catholic and baptize your infants, please. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Let's give a round of applause for our, our panelists.